sign up over there on that white chair near the book table, which I will pass around for those of you who would like to perform and then more to the high yellow uh, three oh, okay. dance. Uh, anything else you'd like to say? This is my lovely wife, Denise, the owner of this establishment. Thank you. Would you like to give us any advice? No. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. All right, well, uh, I, I want to welcome you back, although I know some of you have been out. Uh, this is our first foray into uh, public life since uh, February of 2020. Oh, God. Uh, and we're very happy to begin our, our new public life with Bart White and, and Jennifer Maloney, um, who were kind enough to agree to come out and, and read for us, and also Ken Kelbaugh, who was kind enough to bring this lovely anthology, Moving Images, Poetry Inspired by Film, which, yes, I'm in too. These guys certainly are in. And there's actually, a, there are some hologram poems over there by Jennifer and Bart, who's in front of that book, so really interesting stuff. And I encourage you to take a walk over, um, and hopefully people will walk in. So, um, without further ado, I don't know what I'm supposed to say about you guys. What would you like me to say, Bart? You gotta... Happy to be here. <laughs> Bart's happy to be here. Yeah. He's, also, he's also the author of at least two books that I know of. One that I'm reading now called The Art of Restoration, which is really incredibly good. Oh my God. It's really good. No, it really is. I mean, I read a lot of poetry books. I have a lot of friends who write poetry books. And sometimes I read them. But I'm really <laughs> happy. Yeah, that's amazing. Right? <laughs> Sorry. I would have gone the route of someone like her. Okay. 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 No. <laughs> so I, I love everybody's work. I love everybody's work this year. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm getting old, so I care less than I used to about a lot of things. Um, but Bart's work is fantastic, and uh, really pleased to have him. And Jennifer's work is also great, but I don't have her book. I don't have a book. That's why you don't have it. Well, that's why. <laughs> we'll get on that. Let's rectify that situation. Um, I'm going to, we need to talk about order. Do you guys care? About what? Oh, order. We're going to go together yeah. and talk about anthology. Oh, is that okay? It's better. Okay. You can trade poems. That, yeah. that was the idea. So. That would be awesome. Yeah. All right. Bart White, Jennifer Maloney. Yay! Thank you. Bye. Grace was with us. 
Okay. Uh, okay. Was CD with us that time? No. All right. Well, anyway, it was several of us. And I had written a poem fairly recently uh, because I saw a, a photograph on social media of James Dean in a grocery store. So the, the photograph struck me, struck me as um, really incongruous. I mean, at first glance, it's just James Dean in a grocery store. And he looks like he's, you know, shopping. But then you start to notice the little details of his actual, you know, he's, he doesn't have a cart. He's standing there with a bag and his sunglasses are on and he's in the store. So I thought to myself, you know, I think this photograph is staged, <laughs> you know, and, and I think that it was meant to look like a candid shop. So that's where the poem came from. I read the poem um, at the dinner party and I don't know which of us first said, you know, it would be really fun to do a book. <laughs> she had the inspiration. <laughs> um, you know, about responding to movies, because I think as, you know, Americans, movies have been such a huge part of our lives, especially people our age and, and a little older, you know, going to the movies was a huge, you know, big experience. And, um, and seeing the latest blockbuster was a big experience. These things meant a great deal to me growing up. And as we discussed it, you know, several of the folks who were at the party said, this is a great idea. I would love to, I have poems that I've written about movies, or I would love to write a poem about the movies. And the two of us just kind of, why don't we do this? <laughs> you know? And that's where it started. Um, and I don't know when we started actually getting into it, getting into the nitty gritty of it. So, um, <laughs> cut us off or, or, or snap fingers if you're ready for us to shift into points. Uh, but just very quickly to tell the story of the book, we look around for a publisher. Right. Ken, you're getting ready to get a compliment here, so, so pay attention. <laughs> no, I just remember that there was, a, um, we were really thinking of, of, of uh, trying to get someone over close to Buffalo, and we thought, how would that work practically? Right. Um, there were operations where you would pay a generous amount of money. Uh, with promises. Anyway, when we went to Ken, it was so much, it was wonderful to have like a third partner. Right. To, to work with us and to envision the book and, and, and that we could talk to on a regular basis. So that gave us confidence and you put out a call for submissions right. on Facebook, because you're savvy that way, <laughs> on a Facebook page where, that a lot of writers follow. And right. I think from there it took off and as I remember the submissions Poured in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not, not initially, maybe, but then uh, as the weeks and months went by, right. we had um, over 300 points to read. Easily, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a lot of work, and most of it, I have to say, absolutely fantastic. We had, I had a very hard time. Um, and, and I believe that we were both extremely, um, thank you, diligent. Uh, in going through these pieces, um, really very much line by line and making very, very hard decisions because there was so much good work, so much good work. And we had work from people all over the world, all over. How many continents are represented in this book? Do you know? I think we did know at one point, but there's people, you know, of course, all over North, you know, our country, but- We have boys from uh, 47 continents and they're not that many. <laughs> but we do we uh not at all. <laughs> no. Uh, did you did you know was it four different four or five? We had Asia, In Asia right? India. India. We had the uh, US, England, Africa. Yeah. yeah. Canada. Japan, mm -hmm. Canada, that's a comment. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, but I know. You know what I'm saying? It was all over. We had so much coming and it was uh, exciting and intimidating and turned out to be a lot of fun. So, you want to read a poem? Sure. Yeah. What do you want to do first? I'm going to read first or read? Ladies first. While Jennifer's finding her first poem, um, once we had the poems together, I think for editors, the creative excitement was trying to shape the book and, and to see all the relationships among the poems. Obviously, there were some that were sort of uh, of a kind, 
So the Hitchcock poems, we got a great number of those. They went together with the film noir poems, a lot of poems on the theme of love. So we, we came up with a good section called um, Seductions and Betrayals, because uh, that seems to be a plot device in a lot of movies. Um, for the monster movies, we were monsters and transformation. So we, we kind of really got excited about the um, sections of the poems and, and giving an order to the book. Yeah. So Jennifer, did you find a, a first poem to lead off with? I would like to start with, speaking of James Dean, uh, this is Jonathan Everett's uh, wonderful poem about James Dean called To September 30. Country boys love glamour too, especially when their blue jeans come along for the ride. There's no more cornfield cow pie perfume here. Farewell, hay hungry barns, green, red, and white in the earthy warmth of planting time. No more fat pickup trucks swinging their broad shoulders and brown thighs down dusty, one lane roads. The family set out for fairer skies and plucked the boy's ten toes from his mud stuck boots. Fine by him. There must be a city somewhere. Chrome, a sand, of velvet red drapes and a corn section. Somewhere leather jackets were for show. And there he landed in the center ring, a corn-fed Quaker with a smoldering glare, west of Indiana, east of Eden, a glittering future under a silken mane, a cigarette and a secret tucked behind one ear, a closet full of white t-shirts, and dark vestments. You are tearing me apart, this black and white demigod prophesied in the cellar dark cinema, a line out the door of every movie house. Until the last twilight in September, there, far from silver screens and smug palms, away from starlets and sports cars, the little bastard would find his end and head home one final time to Indiana. One final line out the door to see him. Country boys die at 24. Movie stars are immortal. Nice. Yeah. I'll read a short point for you. Uh, Psycho. How many people remember when you first saw that one? This is. Did it get turned off? We're back on. I just want to make sure it didn't fall out. Uh, by Catherine Cork Sales, Psycho. Afterwards, none of us showered quite the same. Black and white film, chocolate syrup blood, Janet screaming, the water poured, a shriek of violins. Two minutes, 48 seconds, 74 cuts. Change what made us afraid. So um, we put her point uh, in a section called movie making. Uh, Ken, if you're following along, that one's on uh, 98. Um, and I'd like to read another movie making point. Sorry, I had it. called The Starting Point by Laura Glenn. Okay. This was 91. Uh, we like this poem a lot um, because it gets into the mechanics of, a, of, of filming uh, but uses that on a relationship between two people. The Starting Point. I set up the camera, load it, rest it on a tripod and turn it on. It films us. Lying in bed, we design costumes out of sheets and talk. I'm glad that when the film runs out, we still embrace. I prepare solutions in the dark room, wearing gloves I dip in chemicals whose scents I hate and sniff. Under lights, I snip the frames, put the colorful shots in one pile, and in the other, the gray frames where nothing happens except we stretch a distance between us. I toss out of focus ghosts of ourselves into the garbage and splice what's left of one year's work into two separate films. 
I show both at once on two white sheets. Then I shoot my camera in reverse, send images back to life. The door shuts. I'm alone in a room. Fall turns to summer. Fireworks collapse like parachutes in my hand. Dying bouquets of flowers turn fresh. You take them back. Laughter sinks into my belly like a rock. Morning turns to night. My head rests on the pillow, unable to sleep. I let you leave. Echoes become shouts. I speed back to the day we met. Blood becomes flesh in my cheeks. We swallow our words, walk backward from a path we just crossed. I am about to get your attention. I like that poem a lot because I think they did a really um, impressive job of making time run backwards. There's a couple of films that use that technique. And uh, I remember the first time I saw it, how, how struck I was by it. Jen, do you have another poem up? Uh, yeah. yeah. and this is our friend and uh, poet extraordinaire, Bill Hain. Um, we were so happy that he decided to contribute to this anthology. It is called The Director. It begins with an epigraph. Form always stands in dread of power. What the devil will he do next? That's from Emerson. A famous movie director said he worked his ass off and never left a shoot, then stayed up nights with rushes to the point of dehydration and shakes because I want to be there to make sure we don't experience improvisation. When I read this, or when I read this, I had to improvise to get to my next talk because I thought that what I wanted to think was that thinking would not get me to where I wanted to be, but here now already, my director is yelling at me to stop improvising because he's got something else in mind, something stricter, planned, safe. So I reluctantly say, okay, but then my evil red scale megastar claws his way onto the set. <laughs> Lots of fun. I wanted to read, if I can find it, our friend um, CD's poem. Yes. Um, if you can, yeah, tell me where it is. I'm looking for the. For some reason, I can't find it. Table of contents. I'm so sorry, guys. Don't be. We're in. <laughs> where is it? Beast of No Nation? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I just. I'm not sure I can do this justice. Charles read it with such, with his incredible personality and um, it comes through. I'm gonna do my best. This is called Beasts of No Nation by Charles Banks. One, bearers of rotten fruit loaded and with lead, pronounced D-E-A dead, incandescent in incandescent innocence, generations lost to wilderness, blooms bright no more, beasts in packs attack, feed, in fact, the nation's greed adore, though they howl, growl, tear into structures, community loud roars, the leaders lead, followers follow, bows to ambitious greed, rings hollow. Two, Screams, grab what you can, fools. Tools, indoctrinated, insane, set up like ducks in a row. Cops, 5 popo, populace protection down low. Incandescent innocence transcends, but blinks out. It's luminous. Beast packs the dim-witted, dark shrouds their eyes. Within a way we are lost. Nobody answers the calls. The devil rings. It's midnight. 
Um, hard for me to read this stuff. I miss him a lot. Um, do you want to? Okay. Yeah. On a somewhat lighter note, he and Jesus were buds. Uh, this is by Bobby Dumas Panet. It's on page 140. So uh, we got quite a few submissions in the category of uh, what are they? Those things? Uh, robe and sandal <laughs> movies, I believe, is, is kind of a, a sort of mocking term of them. But I do remember in, in our household, they were a big deal when they came on TV and our mother sitting this down to it. This one, uh, he and Jesus were buds. Um, really captures the experience of going out to the movies in a certain time capsule way. Only 11 years old, allowed to go to the movies by ourselves. Short, young adults for 212 minutes, including intermission, white gloves, clutching small purses. We bought our own candy, surrounded by a majestic theater like a royal palace. Ushers strode up and down aisles with loud hush until loud hush descended as maroon velvet curtains parted. MGM's lion roared for us to sit up, to step into AD 26. Carlton Heston has been heard, won the chariot race. My respect and devotion. What a handsome girl, huh? He and Jesus were buds. Hey, yeah, go ahead. I have one that sort of goes along with that. Um, charms. Are you going to read that? Nope. You read the Ten Commandments. It. Yeah. Uh, you find charms. Yep. Um, Jennifer's going to get charms for you after this one. This one's called "Watching the Ten Commandments" by Allison Stone on page one sixty-three. Watching the Ten Commandments. I've forgotten all the sex. Tight costumes, machinations, and murder for lust's sake. The busty prince is moaning, Moses, Moses, like a soap opera queen. The dead firstborns had marked my young mind. The ocean pulled back like a curtain, fear in the drowning horse's eyes. Mostly, I remembered a toddler reaching for Pharaoh's jewels, an angel forcing his hand to the coal his burned tongue, except that scene's not in the movie. No speech impediment for Heston's smooth talking savior. I must have stuck it in from the stories I heard or read, though part of me would swear the tape's been edited and it once played between the basket on the river and the slave's shawl trapped by rock. Imagination trumps fact every time. The way Heston's staff turned serpent, swallowed brinners, our memories stubborn and untrustworthy as any god. The poem, um, <clears throat> he and Jesus were buds, uh, reminded me of this one by Bob Estes, Pulp Charms. The candy that I relished most growing up was only found as far as I knew in classy movie theaters. Charms, they were called. I always got them. Not just them. Milk duds, for example, were good, but not the je ne sais quoi of charms. Just compare the names and think how the duds, those chocolate-covered, warped caramel spheroids, rattled around their cardboard container as earthbound as could be, chewy commodities. Charms were different, seemed meant for screenlit magic, packaged like lifesavers, but with more substantial paper and square in cross section, not round, though beveled and with rounded corners. Without the central pole, but on each face, a tongue nest, circular concavity, hard solidity, gem like shape and color, and presumed translucence gave visual, tactile class, the taste was their enchantment. Tang of fruit flavors, cherry, grape, orange, favored in darkness. Not just the physical taste, but something crazy like platonic taste, a luxury within easy reach to dissolve in leisure, not to fracture, not to crush or rush, 
taste I encountered nowhere else, though fruit cream centers of certain rarely eaten chocolates in a Valentine card box can convey a similar mystery. Now I search for that taste in red wines I can afford, come close at times. I haven't seen charms, don't want to know if they exist. They don't, mine don't. <laughs> I know it's great, <laughs> I can taste it, right? <laughs> mm. Yeah, Sam? No, go ahead. I want to do a pair of Hitchcock inspired poems. Um, we'll wait to the end to uh, tip my hands uh, as to what movie, as to what movie they're from, okay? Uh, they're both by Deborah Ann Tooney. The first one's called Cube. Like Melanie in her telephone booth, we are all caught in our glass cubes. Our hands splayed on the cracked window. We have all been forced into the wild carnage of that fire rimmed street and who will rescue us who'd risk all to fold that door in and pull us out take us back to that room with the cowering villagers their faces now raw with fear and stupidity standing in their circle of communal blame the slap rings true as birds a mass on high drifts of air black laughter darkening their vast outstretch of wings. Bird. Yeah, <laughs> the birds, 1963. Yeah. yeah. That was and, a uh, <laughs> me too, but I showed it to a younger generation, and because um, special effects uh, tend to change, you know, decade by decade, or even more quickly now, they found those special effects uh, of 1963. <laughs> somewhat laughable and I uh, was just horror stricken as they laughed as, as the school children were pecked and bloody. Um, we're on page 83, Kim. This one's called How Foolish. Again, see if you can guess which Hitchcock film. How Foolish. To let them all go, leaving you alone with the murderer and the dark yard struck in its resilient night. The sound of his approach like chains, like the dragging of limbs, as if all the weight of his life was moving, disembodied, toward you. Automaton, horrible, pathetic, and dull-eyed, who says, what do you want from me? His slack face, heavy, a touch, doltish. It's a good question, though, for you are so full of want. But then the flash of redemptive light freezes him. A large, sad man, unloved by his wife, haunting the hallways at 3 a.m. with a suitcase full of knives. Anybody? Remember the real window? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, I like that. Stewart, James Stewart. Yeah, yeah. yeah James Stewart is a photographer and uh, trying to solve the crime. Her her window. Window. What was her name? The beautiful blonde. Was that Grace Kelly? Grace Kelly. 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 Oh, okay, fantastic. I'm gonna, yeah, right now I'm going to read one from uh, also from the film noir section. This is by Stanley Rubin, and it's called At the Kit Kat Club. Beginning with the epigraph, I won't because all of me wants to, from Sam Spade, <laughs> the Maltese Falcon. One, noir. If there had been more light, maybe he would have seen it coming. But he took the blow to the back of his head and fell forward, limp as a ventriloquist dummy, sprawled on the table where they found him, blood spattered, mumbling. But she was just here just a second ago, or maybe an hour. He's lost track of time from the minute he entered, and the music is so loud he never heard what the others were saying at the tables around him. They all seemed to be watching, and nobody warned him as she sat down. 
and leaned close enough to breathe in his ear while she poured a dream in his drink that lingered the way nightmares do. When the fear that conjures them is your own desire and your head swims and your nerves are on fire. Two, dick. The thing you grab onto the way a guy grabs a blonde in a tough guy movie is the thing that will kill you, full of farce and threat that laces your nerves tight. He says, come here, leans her back and kisses her satin mouth, smooth as her stockings, despite the looks of the patrons who include some tough guys, for sure, maybe the boss, whose girl she is. And he survives. Their assassinations, greed, the purple wound, the whole world's rottenness. You were hoping he would survive the blonde, survive even himself. Three, blonde. The Joe who kissed me in the smoky room full of what he thought were strangers was another fool. I could have been a hat check chick. I could have been Delilah. He thought it was his idea to kiss me. What did you know, tough guy? What do you think you did? The boss was watching, as he always is. It was easy to tempt you with lipstick and smoke. It was easy to make you the joker, the mark. Who pulls the strings and why does it matter? A lamb to a slaughter, isn't that what they say? Maybe we all are, maybe all of the time. Um, yes, the Leah poems. Do you want me to or do you want to wait? I'm gonna uh, read a, a short love poem and then I'll pass it over for, uh, okay. I've asked him for a read from a series of poems uh, to pick her favorite. <laughs> so this is from a film I, I confess to not knowing, uh, but I like, uh, the poem is so lovely, uh, I want to read it to you. In French, the title is Un homme et une femme, a uh, man and a woman. Uh, the poet is Renard, and I've got it in my notes to find and watch the film. Un homme et une femme. They were on the fishing boat's fantail, and he was having difficulty lighting his cigarette in the sea breeze. Remember the scene? She opened her coat for him, and he quickly leaned in, using it to block the wind. Is that when they started to fall in love? Except, I don't know if we start to love, or if it's just there, in the heartbeat needed to open two cells to guard the flame together. And then here they are, and if you want to talk, um, yeah. yeah, there's that one, there's the gold king. Okay. Um, that's from Star Wars, right? Yes, these are all Star so, Wars poems. These are uh, not short poems, but they all three came in, and we, we just could not choose a single one. We decided they all were really good together. We will just read, I think, one tonight. But uh, these are all on, um, who's the actress? Carrie Fisher, no? Yes. Yeah. And it's about her, uh, it's really a, a Carrie yeah. Fisher, but it's about her um, performance as Leia in the Star Wars film. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read the first one in this series. It's called Becoming Princess Leia. What to do with the long hair then? I've spent my whole life trying to become the right princess. It's not the Princess Leia of the headphone funds. It's not the ponytail gold bikini Leia of every boy's wet dream. Not the regal, regal Leia of the long braid bestowing medals on Han Solo for a week. The Andor, the Andor Leah, the Leah of the loose hair, the last Leah, the Leah Crystal Gale. The Leah who effortlessly talks back to her father, shoots some stormtroopers, swings across the chasm on a vine with her hot brother, and still manages to look like Alderanian Barbie. Her Samson secret has to be the ability to grow long hair. What shampoo? What spell? Here it is in locks and braids and waves and curls. Here it is at the beach, tangled up in seaweed. Here are the frizzy orange locks chopped off in smirks. I've got a neat short bob now, very professional. I've got it brown too, not. It's more mature, sort of a Carrie Fisher circa postcards. It's much more realistic, especially considering my hair naturally starts to break off at the clavicle. 
I wonder what else I can learn by giving up the link. How to be a novelist or script doctor or a spokesperson for Jenny Craig. It's hard living down the princess. Somehow she always comes back. Could be an unexpected shower, a tiny spike in the humidity, and there she is again, pinning up her hair, chasing after space pirates, living it up in Moe's Isley. One long braid unraveling down her back. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to close out with one final one for this one. Um, our mutual friend, David Delaney, is also a painter. He's a poet and a painter. Uh, if you decide you want the book, you can get it with color plates. Our good friend publisher is over there, Ken Kelba. And uh, it really does look wonderful in color. Uh, the same book is available, though, with black and white in the, in the black stick. But uh, here's a sample of his poetry. Um, and the poem that we chose to end the book, uh, if it weren't for the movies. If it weren't for the movies, I'd never know how to go to war or cradle someone's head caught in patriotic gore where no one's really dead. I'd never learned to dangle smoke in every scene required where crimson nails gently poke velvet hot desire or pose to whisper through a door softly breaking down for a close up just before the bad guy gallops back in town. It seems I've silver screened most everything in actions and replies, caught my hat measuring hellos and goodbyes. But if there's one lasting shot for me, I best recall. It's Toto's tug at the plot, the wonder of it all. Kind of a nice farewell to the movie anthology. Um, George, do you think the, the audio is okay without the mic for, I do. for what you're doing? I do. I'm okay. Picture, but I do. I do think the audio is okay without the mic. We've done one of the circuits before where we didn't have a mic and it's not a big Is that all right with everybody? We can get rid of it. I feel like I'm a little uh, less uh, removed from you guys. <laughs> yeah. and, and George has got the A's trying to ice me. The AC is all full blast, so I've got to go for it. I didn't expect to need a, uh, a fleece in, uh, in June. Uh, as you can hear from my voice, I'm a, a southerner. I've been up here 20 years, and um, the accent's not going in anywhere. So the book I want to read uh, to you from is um, titled The Art of Restoration. <laughs> that, that, that. Is this a work in progress? <laughs> Uh, wow. Man, this feels great. We'll talk. <laughs> okay. I, always a first. Wearing a, wearing a, a muffler in, uh, in, in, in June. Um, the book is uh, called The Art of Restoration. And I got to give a shout out to Jen because I passed the manuscript to her under the title Weight of the World. And I think she held that manuscript like it really was a weight. <laughs> and um, she, thousand one, thousand two, said, I don't know about, about that title, the weight of the world. I think it might be cliche. So um, I said, okay, I rethought it and I found uh, something that I like better. I do like the uh, uplift of a title, The Art of Restoration, um, which comes from the book's final poem. Uh, it does end on an up note. But it does pass through some very, at least for me and my family, very har harrowing stuff in the first section. Um, my family, in my family life, the worst crisis was when our son was addicted and, and went through recovery. And some of you may have a close experience with that and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Or if you've ever had a loved one uh, who really goes off the deep end. So that's the first section. It's called Acrobat with its head on fire. Um, I may relieve you by saying I won't read from that section tonight, only hint at, well, I've got one point that I'll read from it, so you'll get a sense of the collection. I'm going to start by reading from section two, which kept the title, Weight of the World, and which other people have been avoiding reading. So I had friends of mine read from this when we did a book launch, and nobody chose any point from this section. 
uh, but I will. Um, because uh, several of these are, are, are war poems and, uh, you know, they're here, here Ukraine is again. These are not about Ukraine, but they might as well be. This first one's called Almost Touching. Swallows over a river at dusk, rising and falling, almost touching waters, brilliant surface, their bodies mirrored, then gone, flashes each time they turn in the last quarter hour of flight. A woman crossing a bridge at dusk, mirrored in the muddy river below, from behind a sandbag checkpoint, a hand appears to signal stop. Still she comes, head bent, walking swiftly. A sudden flash, pop, pop. Now the veil drops and her hand rises to her startled face, her fingers almost touching the muted O of her mouth. Her eyes catch their final seconds of life. The first part of that poem was inspired by going over a bridge. I remember this as, as it might have been 390, it might have been I-90, but just such beauty in the late hours of summer. And I'm sure you may have had this experience of driving and just how utterly beautiful Western, North, uh, Western New York is. And for some reason, somehow, those swallows over that little stream that we drive across just connected with some bit of news, some little piece that I had read about our war in, in, uh, in Iraq and trying to pacify the place. This one's called News Photo, Airstrike. In a bare room, on a blanket on the floor. Sorry. In a bare room, on a blanket on the floor, laid out like apples, like produce, on a market vendor's table. Three small boys with peaceful faces with mouths open slightly, as if each had just sighed, and half-moon eyes are closed for night. Small signs, trickle of red turning brown, trails from a nose over a bruised cheek and down, also in the ears, where it cools. Three brothers, straight and still, Heavier than a roof, their father collapses. Friends plead and try to stand him up to lift and lead the man away, but he won't go. He beats the ground. Besides his sons, he calls to them. They will not come. Their faces and hair dusty with a fine white powder. A range, large to small, in a row. That was the last poem in your book I was able to read. That was the end of it for me. Sorry. No, no, it's very powerful. I'm looking for poem number five. I think it is. Um, this was called Spring Planting. Spring Planting. In the fields around Taishan, farmers grow rice in the demilitarized zone between the two Koreas. All day, propaganda songs blare from speakers on high poles. The 197 residents of Taishan are used to it and go about their work on plots of land their families have farmed for generations. From their rice fields, they see miles of razor wire and blunt gray concrete bunkers. They know beyond their land the ground is mined and in giant silos underground, the warheads wait for a touch of a button. It is not peace, but they are farmers and it is springtime in the cold mud of the fields. They are planting rice. Are these um, soldiers that wrote these poems? No. No, I, I, that was uh, my interpretation of a, of a, a, a news story, a oh. New York Times news story about uh, this place that's been to Korea, and here we are. 
that there was a war over and done, supposedly, in 1953. And all these decades later, that's the way they're living. Um, and a more recent one. Sorry. Um, which way? My editor, John Roche, asked me, we were in the process of putting the poems in the final form and said, would you want to respond to this? And I hesitated um, for a couple of weeks and, and tried to do my best. Which way? I think we, uh, each of us remember the beginning of what's going on now in Ukraine. Maybe. The dreaded event begins, the abstraction. The topic of heated argument or disbelief materialized last Thursday at the end of the block. Muzzle trained on their apartment, barrel jutting obscenely up. Which way? Road signs pulled down to confuse the invader. Which way? Morning fog envelops them. Which way to the border and how far? Nine hours. They haven't moved. Somewhere ahead is a crossing point. Families are abandoning their cars, pulling suitcases, carrying babies. They walk. This must be the way. His own two children curl on a back seat. He shakes his son, bends and whispers in his ear, you are the man now. The boy blinks awake, nods solemnly, and bursts into tears. He lifts out of the air. What pieces in her sleeping face, kisses and passes her into her mother's arms. Brown earth, hard snow, a rumpled field, gray woods far off. This unnamed stretch of road is where they park. He backs the car around. Burning through the fog, the sun's a disk of white. East is this way, then, and Kiev where he is needed. Frozen leaves, so that one, who knows how that one will end. But I can't help but think of that Korea poem. Um, and here's another one and I'll wrap up with the set of war poems and uh, move on to something else. Um, frozen leaves in two parts. Uh, the first part, some of you, uh, anybody in the room, well, Minden Pond Park, it doesn't matter. It's all Western New, uh, North, New, New York. I keep wanting to say North Carolina. Western New York. <laughs> Frozen leaves. One, tricked by this February sun that shines bright and casts sharp shadows but brings no heat. I blow into gloves to revive stiff fingers, tuck my chin into this thin jacket, and walk faster along the ridge path. The dog trots with purpose ahead of me. Scanning the trail's steep drops on either side into bowls, glaciers carved when ice retreated long ago. Jasper steps off on the crisp leaves, sniffs and lifts a leg to pee. Hundred acre pond, still frozen. Fisherman on it two weeks ago, but wouldn't trust it now. A hundred geese far out on the thinning ice, some floating where water's opened up already. In the hollow of a fallen trunk, Snow clings unmelted after 50 degree afternoons. Trunks curve, shades, and protects it. Last snow in the tree's cool heart, tucked in a bed of frozen leaves. A good day to be alive out here, walking in the cold. Two, children freeze at night in the camps outside Kabul. They cannot keep the blankets pulled tight around them. They are too young to ask for help. If there's no fire and they fall asleep, they die. He was never warm in his entire life, Ishmael's father said, not once. Short life, 30 days. $3.5 billion in humanitarian aid could not save Ishmael in a patch of wasteland outside the camp. His son is buried with the other children. There are no headstones. Tila knows the place. She goes there every day to visit her brother. In the morning, his color was dark. 
like when a leaf is frozen, I pick him up and his body is stiff, like a frozen leaf. So I suspect um, our empathy sometimes comes with self-identification. Um, those parents, that refugee camp in Afghanistan or the father with the loss of his sons and the nearest I've ever come to experience in person, but here's one called Song of Praise. And the thing for me in perhaps for you uh, absorbing world news, again, in a place like this of such peace and beauty is an, it, it's a kind of a jarring disconnect sometimes. Hopefully, at least a sense of uh, you know how fortunate we are. But this one's called Song of Praise. Seven diamonds on a leaf, seed heads heavy with last night's rain, their thin stalks bending. A fresh morning finds my sun and the world restored. In my nightmare, see him fall into the floor, see his black hole mouth, his eyes roll back into nothing staring mockingbird on a low branch locks eyes with mine turns her head to match each step i take till she's looking back over her shoulder so close i see her feathered neck and how she tucks her banded wings the mockingbird stays quick hops reversing her perch and now she sees me better she neither reaps nor sows. I have my green fields. I have my sun. Such shepherding should give me faith that I might shout Hosanna for the blue sky, for the wet grass shining, for my sun, not dead. Deep within a tree, my little guardian releases a pent up burst. All her being pulses with singing, singing on and on so that I may know how praise should sound. Or I'll read a couple more. Then we get, okay. Thanks. Here's a short one. I believe this one's from the third section, The Art of Restoration, where the poems do try to gain a little bit of balance and uh, recover some sense of joy. Midsummer Sunday morning, a boy glides by, perfectly westward out of the dawn, chasing his own dark shape, stretched before him, boy, fight, shadow, on Devon Wood. Now he's turned round. Pedals madly back toward light, yelling loud enough to wake all sleepers. Does he shout the rush of wind, the thrill of speed, beauty of his machine flashing in the sun, or the shadow that pursues him so swift and close behind? And this poem is called Strange Ditch. If you pass through an emotional crisis, sometimes when you come out the other side, you may have a feeling like this. Emotional crisis makes it sound a little superficial. Um, how about a close call or something really awful? Here we go. Strange dish. I was once served a strange dish. I was on my knees beside a road, confused as this was not my place. And wondering why I didn't stand and walk away from there when I felt myself shoved by an invisible hand into a ditch. Well, this is it, I thought. Goodbye. But the lights out bullet didn't arrive, nor was I thrust under the ditch water and drowned. The hand I could not see held my head at the surface and I saw my face wavering in brown water. Then, really weird, a bright silver thimble rose to my lips to serve me a taste. 
of the foul liquid. I didn't want it. Still my mouth opened and the tiny cup tipped and poured its measure down my throat. My teeth locked tight. I could not open my mouth to spit. So finally I swallowed that scalding bitterness. Years later, I've eaten fruit and tasted many rich desserts and held their sweetness in my mouth, looked round the table with affection for the good company, savored the wine, gold or ruby in glasses lifted and marked the moment. And the other one too, somber, eternal taste of bitter mouth and tongue cannot unknow. I was once a, a strange dish, my invisible hand compelled to taste. Mm. I close out. Oh, okay. Please. Okay. Um, let's try to get a little lift here. In the end. This is called The Art of Restoration. Jennifer, I hope you like the title. Again, I'm, I'm glad I didn't call it way to work, but it does feel like a way to work. Um, and uh, although this one says not for resale and comes right across this painting, my good friend Ken has a book, uh, and, and, and the cover is um, a painting from a painting done by my good friend David Delaney. You heard him in uh, the movie Anthology. David, I'm so uh, endeared to and, and grateful for that image. Uh, he read the poem and, and produced that, so I, I think it fits pretty well. Um, I was looking at my wedding pictures. Uh, married men should do that from time to time. And here's, here's what um, this, that led to. Remembering for the art of restoration. Some strangeness creeps into this ordinary word to make me think of reattaching body parts. Remember the famous statue on the landing of the grand staircase of the Louvre, her battered torso, headless, armless, yet striding forward, sea wind pressing against belly and breast, wave splashed garment pulling tight across thigh with two strong wings sweeping up from her shoulders. The air in the museum is still. There is no wind or sea. Imagine a sculptor covered in dust and sweat as he works the stone with mallet and chisel, carving from rock an illusion of thin cotton clinging to a woman's body. Would you like to remember her? Give back a pair of lovely arms and a head? See her whole once more as those sailors did, wearily rowing boats into harbor, lifting oars, vessels gliding into a sweet homecoming. On our wedding day, years ago, the photographer lifted his arms, waded into the crowd at the reception, camera high above his head to get the shot of many people pressing close, gesturing with their hands. I see my two friends from my bachelor days who drove all night from New York. There's my mother, beaming with happiness, talking with Inez and Stokes. Stokes cups an ear behind his, Stokes cups a hand behind his ear. The din of voices so loud, his forehead and my mother's nearly touch. The packed room of that photograph has thinned out so many members of a, gen of a wedding missing. A generation gone. I would put them into the picture as living souls again. I would remember them. And while I'm at it, I want to repair the goddess. Remember her arms, find her ahead, get her out of that museum, back to her island sanctuary, back to a grove of pines on Samothrace and set her on a vantage point where she can scan the blue horizon for the homecoming of Odysseus, Agamemnon, 
and Achilles, Uncle Stokes and Aunt Inez, my two lost pals from New York, New York City, for my father and my mother, for all the boats returning, calm and patient in her vigil, poised to greet the long absent, waiting for the last arrival, and on her bare arms the breezes steady from the sea. <laughs> you made me cry. That was lovely. Um, Lisa, thanks so much. I, I is there time, George? Is that oh, yeah. 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 Um, could you pen me in speech for a minute? just realized that I should probably read that. It's the, the poem that um, that I have in there, kind of, uh, thank you. I wrote it at, um, I wrote it in response to the Kavanaugh. Uh, is this on? Nope. <laughs> um, and now I don't know where my glasses are. I've got these. Those are mine. We're, we're competitive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're fine. <laughs> I'm kind of sad. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is for sale, and so I thought I would read you um, my piece um, from Women Speak. This is called Learning. One second, I'll get this together. Learning. Here's what you don't know. You spike drink drunk. Sucker punch, prick, frat boy, white boy, rich boy. Need a friend to hold me down. Need a good friend to get you up. Whiskey dick, coked up. Need a daddy. Want your mama, master of the universe? Laugh riot, self-loathing, cum stain. You can make me. You can take me. But you cannot have me. Stop. Wait. No lies. You hurt me. You took my life. What could have been is gone, flown, risen like air, scattered like ashes. What remains? Here's what you don't know. You friendless fuck, maggot, slimy, suck, asshole, buddy, big mouth, shit scared, private school, pasty face, pimple, piss pot. You are losing. I I'm loosed. You broke the box I came in, broke it, came in it, discarded it, debased it, but all you did was free me from it. Like the air, I rise above it. Now I love it, my bent and twisted little self, uncrippled by awakening, shaped by hurt. The dirt you shoved me into shifted, became good soil. I grew. Broken glass against my face became the sparkle in my eyes because I rise and shame the lies you fell. Don't yell. We heard you. You were all we heard. All anybody listened to for years. Our ears full of boys will be boys. What were you wearing? Had you been drinking? What were you thinking? Going there alone. Walking there at night, smiling at those boys, knowing what could happen. You wanted it to happen, slut. Thor got a bad reputation, ruining his good reputation, his good name, his good life. Did you even think about his wife? Close your mouth, close your legs, shut up, shut down. Shh. Stop. This has to stop. I won't stop. What's broken is silence. Not me. I am mended, befriended, lifted by sisters, brothers, others held and held together. Not whether we tell, it's only when. Here's what you don't know. You are done winning. And like air, we rise. By um, the poem uh, by uh, Maya Angelou, and in response to a challenge that um, all of the poems uh, in this book are actually acrostic poems. They are 
inspired by pieces that the artist who created the book painted. It's really beautiful, and there's a lot of good work in it. So, thank you. And Nancy did the cover. Nancy did the cover. Nancy did all the illustrations in there. It's gorgeous. Um, I thought I'd read something for Pride Month. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, this is called How Long, and it is actually published in one of the um, Image Outright uh, volumes from, I, I think it's in volume seven, uh, which came out in 2018. Um, okay. This is called How Long. At the coffee house on South, I wait for you, and she. I drink tea made of sweet red flowers, and I don't smoke the cigarette I want to smoke, but I haven't smoked for six years now. It's been four months and a new girl since I've seen you. Is that enough? Because I'll wait for four more months, a year, another girl or boy, a pack of cigarettes, another summer, winter, spring, a novel, a new poem, a bowl of fruit. I'll wait a wedding, a birth. I'll wait a war, a pestilence, a new administration, a sun and a moon, and a long rainy day, a text message, an email. I'm not good at it, but I practiced. If you come tonight, open the door, walk in, pull out her chair, order a dirty chai, and smile. Sit down next to me close enough to touch, like you're my friend, my friend who taught me waiting is nearly just the same as love. It's close enough, close enough to touch as your fingers, square tipped and blunt as truth sweep across her face like the hands of a clock, caress her chin, kiss the red flower of her mouth. I turn my face toward the street. Watch the unending stream of passing cars, the ancient burning stars following their courses. Down the street, a church bell chimes, and like all changeless things, I wait. the moon in June. Um, this was uh, inspired by uh, a tweet, actually. And the tweet went like this. To anyone who is upset that LGBTQ people stole the rainbow, rain itself is next, soon to be followed by the sun. The moon is already a le lesbian. <laughs> the moon is plainly trans, clearly queer. The moon knows what it is to move from phase to phase, growing fuller or leaner, to change. The moon is fluid and never just one thing or another. Why would anyone expect the moon to only ever be full or new? The moon is non-binary, exists on a spectrum, dresses strictly in evening wear, silver or black unless drifting, crushing an Esther Williams inspired white bathing cap and sky blue swim ensemble, winking a come hither smirk at golden boy sun. Oh, elegant moon, dangling Venus from one ear, the least understated piece of jewelry in the universe. You're a queen. You stop heaven like a runway, drag the Milky Way behind you, the most fabulous of bones. Oh, love it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
um, this is something that uh, it's fairly recent, actually. Um, I wrote it uh, during a workshop um, that I actually haven't been in in a while, but was for a large part of last year um, with Craig Shuri. Um, and it was very generative, and he's still doing them. They are Zoom classes, and if anybody wants the information, Craig Shuri's on Facebook. It's spelled C Z U R Y, or me, Jennifer Maloney, and I'll direct you there. Okay. Uh, this is called Stock Talk. It was published by Panoply Zine, probably in 2020. I heard the commotion last night, the panic, the screams, watched you flung from the window at the edge of this bean field where I too am planted. I stood sturdy, for beans are brave. Saw your ascendance, your first small greenness, poke up fast, spread and rise, unleashed from this earth like a howl screaming skyward. Already, giant leaves billow like sails, and fruit the size of sailing ships swells from an exuberance of tendrils, running out in all directions. You enchant me, your stock thick as a trunk, your blossoms untwist, open orange throats, standing stamens wink with hurt attention above lonely pebble tongue. You deity, your body could feed them all. The starlings that tossed you like trash into this field, the village, the kingdom itself with your fruit, plump and sweetening in the sun. They could harvest today what might nourish them for years. Save your seeds, plant your progeny, grow giant beans forever. Just in case though, my lovely, my beautiful beanstalk, in case they are stupid, don't realize what you offer, see you only as a monster, a curiosity, something to use to get them somewhere to something they can never eat. Swing one gorgeous, drowsy, nodding flower head above me. Drizzle some of your magic golden dust down here. Who are we kidding? These fools won't bring baskets, just an ax. Kiss me now. I'll keep the secret of your love until next year when they'll all have killed each other off in pursuit of golden eggs and singing harps. When summer comes again, our huge headed babies will sprout from our rot and butterflies and ravens will feast. Kiss me now. My whole body shimmies at the thought. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That last line was actually the prompt line. That's one of the things we did in that class was toss, toss each other lines from poems we had written. And I got my whole line shimmies. So that's where that, prompt, that poem came from. Um, so I'm just going to do like one or two more. I think we're about ready to be done, probably. Thanks. I'm sorry. Oh, this is James Dean Go Shopping, which is the poem that started the whole anthology. So you <laughs> can well hear that one too. Um, this also is called James Dean Go Shopping, and it is from a photo of the Akron grocery store in Marfa, Texas, during the shooting of Giant in 1955. James Dean, perusing shelves of Miller High Life and Campbell's Soup. James Dean, contemplating packaged pasta. James Dean, in sharp-toed shoes, white chinos, madra shirt, unbuttoned to the belly crease, sweet slice of man chest on display, rolled up sleeves, and empty of smokes. Why does he wear sunglasses in the store? Why does he carry a bag, not a basket? Make like you're still shopping, James, shouts the fan, or the studio employed photographer snapping candids, and James obliges, neck of the sack crumpled in his right palm, magazine curled in his left, waits, obedient as a child, for another small moment of his life, 
to be taken, for his real life to start unschooling again, for whether it's just on camera, laughing at the big movie star who causes a commotion just by employment paper. In a moment, they will step outside. James will fish the fresh pack of luckies from the bag and light one, hop into the Porsche, pop the top from a cold Coke, slide it between his thighs, rip it snug for the drive to Salinas. He won't spill a drop till he gets where he's going. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, this is, uh, yeah, for some reason, I think I must have collected some of the stuff, some of the pieces that I published and put them, I didn't realize that's what this is. But um, this was published in uh, Middle State Tennessee University's um, uh, anthology a couple of years ago. I cannot recall what the name of the anthology is. It was, uh, Shift, it's called Shift. Uh, this is called At Unity Hospital, Autumn. 2015. My favorite color is the color of your eyes when they are closed, a color I have to close my eyes to see. My favorite color is the color of the sun after the 2 a.m. hospital when all the other reds and yellows are only piss and blood. My favorite color is the color of the lake in this picture from 40 years ago. You are standing, squinting, grinning under willow trees, under a hat bleached to no color at all, except the silver of a hundred flashy lures. And my favorite color is the color of a large mouth bass, hanging heavy from your index finger, drooping, dripping, the color of algae, earthworms, and night. My favorite color is the color of your hospital gown. Your favorite color is green, the color of life. I watch a sunrise, the color of the parking lot. Other patients come, go, splintered, bones splinted, close calls caught like fish, gasping and green, with another day on this blue earth. My favorite color is the color of the insides of my eyelids when I'm sleeping. When I dream, you fish and the brilliant dragonflies, electric blue and hot rod red, skim a lake the color of summer air, tempting great green bats to the surface. They swim through eternity, take the bait like a promise. You jerk the line, set the hook, let them run. So soon they tire, and you laugh like a god, bringing them in, pull them green from the blue, Lay them in their white belly rows, trailing smears of blood and sparkling mucus on a wide and empty beach, which is my very favorite color, the color I must close my eyes to see. Thank you. That's my dad. Um, he came close in 2015 to losing his life, and it was pretty scary, as you can imagine. Um, so I'm just going to read one more, I think, um, sorry, I'm trying to find something. Um, this is uh, a poem I wrote a couple years ago, and people have taken to calling it the pancake poem. Um, and I think it's a good one to end on. This is called How We Make Love. It's Fat Tuesday, and you and I are eating pancakes for dinner, and it's just happy accident. Mardi Gras not even on the radar as we sinned busily all afternoon, then slept the sleep of innocence. Just too late. It's six o'clock, and we have plans at seven, and what's quick? Scrambled eggs. Melt the butter in the pan and you say, pancakes, of course. Shrove Tuesday, Pancake Tuesday, and then we make them. Crowded over your tiny stove, we make scrambled.
scrambled eggs and pancakes. We eat standing in your kitchen, leaned up against the countertops, holding our plates. We eat the way I ate pizza with my roommates at school, the way I ate peanut butter sandwiches at my best friend's house in 1979, the way people eat when they do not have time to stop talking, when the words pour like melting butter, like maple syrup, easy and sweet and more and fast. We eat like we are starving for this conversation. Heaps and piles and enormous mouthfuls and no time for dinner tables just butts up against the sink and a roll of paper towels. And in the middle of all these warm, rising, browning, vanilla scented words, you are suddenly staring out your New York kitchen window into Maine. It is Sunday supper, autumn, and you are watching your mother make crepes. Look, she tells you, see how the edges get all lacy-like? That's how you know, she says, how you know you got it right. How do we make love? Is it the cinnamon scent of soap and skin? The uplift of an eyebrow, the surprise brush of the backs of hands? Maybe it is made by happy accident, the coincidence of sin and suffer. Maybe food and talk and memory collude, imbue conversations with something like shared truth. I know I saw her. She was standing at her stove. You were with her, and you were learning to make crepes. You were getting it right. Thank you. take my mask off to thank you both. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I will admit my enthusiasm I, I, in my promotion for this event I refer to you guys as Rochester Poetry Legends <laughs> and I think I would change that to Powerhouse which you guys are really just Aww. incredibly great. I love um, no really I, and uh, you know I don't know what to say I just you know riveting is it? just riveting. George thank you so much. Yes, and thank he's you very much. Big I know I'm, I'm missing. Back out the window this way. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna. No, it's, uh, it's really sweet. Thank you. I was so thrilled to be here. It's like I call the card. It's been years since I've read, and this is wonderful. It's, it's really it's pretty it was, scary. Yeah. Great, great, great to have hey, you guys. Kim wants to get a picture, and then we're going to go from Mike. We are going to do a little over Mike. We, we, okay. Yeah, we're definitely going to do a little over Mike. Can I picture this? Um, yes, we're not. Yeah, Let's put the host in the middle. Is that okay, Jennifer? We'll get rid of this thing. who wants to do something in the open mic or hasn't signed up, you want to raise your hand or sign up. Oh, there's there's the sign up right there. I'll bring it over to you. Okay, sounds great. Here you go. And um, Bart, Bart started going down this road, so I'm going to continue down this road a little bit. I uh, sort of kick this off and launch us into open mic territory. Um, last month, I was writing a um, a poem called "Bloom in the Blitz," which is like a chapbook length poem, imagining Leopold Bloom from Joyce's Ulysses. Uh, if he had lived long enough.